I'm going to record it as well. Uh, so hi, everybody. My name is Ethan Tapper. I'm the Chittenden County Forester. Just briefly on, on what county foresters are, if you're in Vermont, you have one. Um, there's 13 of us for Vermont's 14 counties. And our primary role is to help uh, the owners of private land in those counties understand how to manage their forested land better. Um, and so our job is just sort of broadly to support the health of forests and the responsible management of forests in our county. Um, and so it's a really big job and there's a lot of different parts to it. Obviously, there's um, a lot of things that go into that from the various threats to our forests um, to the various opportunities for managing them in really, really good way. So one of the, the, the persistent problems or persistent threats that we encounter um, is the presence of invasive exotic plants. Um, and so this is a, a problem that's much bigger than Vermont. It's, it's a worldwide problem. And uh, enough questions come up about it in, in other contexts that we really just wanted to, to spend a day or a, a session, an hour here, uh, just talking about invasive exotic plants and their management. So my caveat for this would be that I'm a forester. And if you know foresters, you know that we're sort of big picture people. And so there are other people, people who specialize in invasive plant management, who are really tuned into the minutia of how these plants work um, and how to manage them in a very specific way. My approach is much more of a systems approach and also as a practitioner because uh, I do manage these invasive plants on my own land. I've managed them as, a, as an invasive control contractor. Um, and so I think I've come up with some, some tools and tricks and perspectives that are helpful uh, for your average person. And so that said, um, I'm gonna start the presentation now. I'm hoping that I'll keep the presentation to, to half an hour or less. There's, there's a lot to be said, but I would really, really like to focus on your questions. So again, if you have questions, please just type them in the chat box and we will address them um, at the end of the presentation. All right. So we're focusing on woody uh, invasive exotic plants in your forests. And so woody plants plants with wood, um, they are by far the, the most common one that we deal with in, in the forestry context. Obviously, there are a lot of other uh, non-woody plants, which are also really important. Um, and there are also invasive exotic plants, diseases, pest pathogens, which are also important. But for the, for the, the context of this particular workshop, we're going to focus on woody invasive exotic plants. And so what are invasive exotics? Um, exotics are essentially plants, animals, pests, pathogen, pathogens, uh, existing outside of their native range. Uh, the movement of species you know, throughout history is, uh, is normal and is regular. But what we're seeing is that what makes these exotic is that within, let's say in North America over the last 300 years since European settlement, there has been this explosion of, of new uh, organisms on, in our environment to, in a proportion that is completely irregular compared to the background level of, of new introductions that we'd see in any sort of a, a native or natural system. And so those uh, new, in, new introductions we call exotic. Um, invasive is, is a, a subjective assessment. So basically something that is spreading prolifically in a way that is in some way harmful. So this is similar to the definition of like, what's a pest? A pest is something that is interfering with something that we like. Um, and so invasives can also be said to be somewhat subjective. Although there is a widespread agreement among you know, the ecosystem, the natural resource management communities about what constitutes an invasive plant in this case. Um, we do have a lot of exotic plants. So of Vermont's 2,800 plant species, about 600 are thought to be introduced, you know, since European colonization. Um, and that is from uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife. So, you know, that's over 10% of our plants. If you think about it, basically, you know, Vermont was 95 plus percent forested. Most of the plants that we have that are associated with like fields um, are exotic, but not all of them are invasive in that they are not spreading into our natural environments in a way that's harmful. In a global context, there's sort of all these different drivers of um, uh, threats to global biodiversity um, and the health of our planet. You know, the big three in, in many contexts is considered to be habitat loss, climate change, and biological invasions. They're, they're a major threat to global diversity, and this is including uh, introduced animals, introduced plants, and introduced uh, pathogens and other pests. Uh, 
According to the National Wildlife Federation, 42% of endangered species are primarily threatened by invasive exotic pests, and invasives are said to account for about half of all extinctions of which the cause is known. I will say that with the caveat that most of those are invasive animals that are introduced into these very sensitive island ecosystems, but plants, insects, and pathogens are also included in that. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is teach you or, or give you a primer on identifying Vermont's most common woody invasive exotic plants. Um, it can be very intimidating when you look at these lists of invasive um, exotic plants because there's just a lot of them. And so these are the ones that you are likely to see. There are localized invasions of other species as well, but these are by far the most common in our state. Shrub honeysuckle, common buckthorn, Japanese barberry, Asiatic or oriental bittersweet, uh, glossy buckthorn, and multiflora rose are the ones that I'm gonna uh, teach you to identify and the ones that I would focus on. Also locally common, um, in the southern part of the state especially, uh, we see a lot of burning bush. Um, black swallowwort, uh, I found it in Charlotte this year. I understand that it's also very prominent in Windsor County. Um, autumn, olive and, autumn olive and Russian olive are, are two different species in the genus, genus Eliagnus, which are also locally common. Um, and non-woodies, so non-woody plants to be aware of that also have implications for forest management, Japanese knotweed, phragmites, and garlic mustard. So just to keep th these on your radar, if you're sort of narrowing down your list of possible invasives to look for, these, this is a pretty good list to start with. So first we're gonna cover shrub honeysuckle. This is the most common invasive that I, I see. It was a commonly planted ornamental. Um, still persists uh, in many people's gardens. Uh, it grows as a shrub. It's less than six feet tall in most cases. Multiple stems emanating from a, from, uh, a common root system. Uh, one of the ways you can identify its twigs and leaves is that it branches opposite, which just means that the, the leaves, the buds, occur opposite one another across a twig or a stem at a perfect 45 degree angle. So you'll see that the twigs branch off that stem opposite one another at that perfect 45 degree angle. The, the wood is brittle, so if you like break it, it will like snap cleanly. Um, it's pithy and the pith is hollow, um, as you can see from this picture here. The leaves are, are, I sort of describe them as like if you were a child, what a child would draw um, if they were just drawing a picture of a leaf. It's uh, what we call entire, um, which just means it's not toothed, it's not lobed, it's not serrated, it's just smooth margin leaf shaped leaf. Um, the underside of the leaf also, if you flip it over, is much lighter in color and it's slightly woolly. Um, right now, this is what they look like. Um, and this is also just a good uh, illustration of what their form looks like growing as this sort of intense uh, shrub with many different stems. Right now, they'll just be budding out, so they'll look like this. Um, and then later, those leaves will fill out more fully. They do have pretty flowers. So this is why, this is why most people grew them ornamentally, because they have these nice looking flowers. They can be white or pink or um, yellow in some cases and are showy. And they often have, um, I would also say, red berries. So with all these invasives, a really good time to look for them is right now because um, they are one of many ways that they're sort of interlinked with climate change is that they're able to, to leaf out sooner and retain leaves later than our native species. And so they're able to take advantage of longer growing seasons. So right now, if you go out in your woods, you'll see this like what I call the green haze, which will just be all the invasives in your understory will all be leafing out and it's actually a really good time to visualize the extent um, and, and of your problem and where it is on your property. Another one that we see a lot of um, is common buckthorn. This is a very, very common one, especially um, I see in the Champlain Valley, but kind of everywhere. Um, it was originally, I understand, grown as a, a living fence. So again, all of these invasive plants are introduced. None of them were um, accidentally introduced, like some of the pests and pathogens that we deal with. Um, these, uh, so this was planted as essentially a living fence because it makes this very dense growth that you can actually see along, along a lot of hedgerows. Um, if you go to Shelburne Farms in Shelburne, you'll see these really, really thick hedges of, of common buckthorn. Um, the, everything about common buckthorn is black. So, you know, I describe it as it's like evil. So it's, everything about it is black. So it has these black buds 
um, which are sub-opposites. So they can appear to be almost opposite one another, but they'll always be at least a little offset, not perfectly opposite one another like the honeysuckle. And the reason they're called buckthorn, they don't have true thorns, but in some cases, the end of the twig um, will just end in this little prickle. And that's because um, they have indeterminate growth. So they just grow and grow and grow until basically uh, the, the season ends and they can't grow anymore. And sometimes they'll be like midway through a twig and they wouldn't have got to the next bud. And that's what that prickle is. It's just a sort of partial twig. A characteristic you'll notice later in the year is that um, their leaves are dark and glossy. Um, they will be distinctively dark and glossy compared to to other tree species and plant species that you're gonna see. And they also have this kind of venation, uh, these deeply embossed veins in the leaf. Uh, it's called arcuate venation. So that what that means is that the leaves essentially arc out towards the margin of the leaf and then come in again towards the tip and make these sort of parallel veins in, um, as compared to normal leaves, which just sort of uh, the veins go straight out to the margin of the leaf. That venation will catch your eye. It's very, very distinctive. They have black berries. Um, so they are dioecious. So there are male and female buckthorns. So not every single one will have berries, only the females. Um, but they, the, the black berries are, um, are a very distinctive characteristic if you get them at the right time. Um, they make uh, birds eat them and it makes birds have diarrhea. So the, the Latin name is Ram, Ramnus cathartica, and that cathartic is in reference to, to the fact that they're a, a diuretic. That's what they look like in most cases. So the, the form of buckthorn often resembles a wild apple tree, and I actually see people sometimes like mowing around them and tending them like they're wild apple trees because they think they are. Um, they, they, when they're larger like this, they'll have sort of a vase-shaped appearance, and they'll, they'll branch out low, but they're, they will be a small tree. Um, more so, more than a shrub like honeysuckle. They will often have a single stem um, and they can be up to about like 10 feet tall. And the bark is, um, when it's small, it's like metallic and black. And when it's larger, it can get kind of shreddy and peely, almost like birch bark, but it's a, like a grayish black. The one that, if you go to um, southern parts of New England, but increasingly in Vermont as well, this is the invasive that they're really freaked out about. And I had almost, uh, oh, probably 15 acres of pure Japanese barberry in the understory of my forest in Bolton. Uh, and it is uh, extremely virulent. Um, so uh, its leaves are distinctive. The leaves are shaped like a teardrop. So um, semi-circular, but then coming into this very tapered stem into the, into the twig. There and they'll grow in these little clusters. So there'll be these little buds, um, which will be like a bulge from the twig, and then there'll be this cluster of um, of leaves around it. And then under those bulges will be a single, what's called a stipular thorn. So just these little needle-like thorns, which will grow out just from under those bud clusters. So those leaves, the shape of the leaves, the way that they taper into the stem like that, and then also the fact that they grow in those clusters, and that under the cluster is a single thorn is a very good characteristic for identifying Japanese barberry. Um, so there's, a, there's an example of those thorns. Those thorns, if you ever try and pull barberry, it's awful. And they, they'll, they'll get under your skin, they'll break off in your skin, they'll be really hard to get out. Um, they actually, some people have an allergic reaction to them. So if I get barberry thorns in my skin, my, my hands swell up, um, which is unpleasant. They also, so this is also a widely planted ornamental, I should say, and the large reason for that is because of these red berries. So they have these red tic-tac shaped berries um, that persist even after the leaves are gone. And that's what they look like. So they grow into these big, um, they, they have these basal buds which make them sort of produce all these stems right from the root collar, right from where the plant meets the ground. And so they produce these just very dense thickets and they sort of spread laterally and just take over space. And because of that, and because of, there's a couple different reasons that the, the habitat that they present to mice and other things which carry ticks, there is a distinct uh, increase in tick populations in areas with Japanese barberry infestations. Oriental bittersweet, this one, um, 
didn't wasn't on my radar as much until I started dealing with it on my own land and saw uh, what a problem it can be. It's a really aggressive cedar. Um, it can really kill a lot of trees um, and pre present some sort of ecosystem problems. It's a vine. Um, this was also planted. There are foresters that I work with who are not old, who remember planting this on purpose in power line corridors with the idea that it would it would pull down native species, native uh, trees, and and basically keep the power line corridors clear. I think it was also planted on the side of of highways and stuff like that. Um, and uh, what it does is just basically wrap around trees. Sometimes it, you can see trees that look like this, wrap around trees and kills them and pulls everything down to the ground and creates these incredibly dense clumps and where it can just kind of grow over everything. Um, it has this light brown bark with these little diamond shaped pox in it, which are called lenticels. Um, the feature that most people will know is these red berries so that there'll be a yellow husk and then inside that yellow husk will be these little red berries. And that's why when I was growing up, we used to make bittersweet wreaths, you know, and you, which would have those red berries to accent um, the wreath itself. And then when you're done with the wreath, what do you do? You, you know, chuck it over the bank or whatever and start a new, uh, new bittersweet infestation. Um, that's a characteristic that most people know. And in the winter time, you'll see those, those berries popping out um, up in the crown of trees where bittersweet has reached. And that's what you'll see if you drive down 89 or more further south, like 91, um, and other highways farther south, you'll just see that all the roadsides look like this. The bittersweet has completely coated all the vegetation um, and just pulled everything down to the ground, created an environment where basically nothing but bittersweet can survive. Um, on, for context, on my property, I killed, um, my property uh, borders the highway. And I killed one bittersweet vine and um, killed some other invasives and created some space, maybe an area about 10 feet by 10 feet. And in that, which was sort of under that bittersweet vine, in that area, the next year, there was probably uh, 20 bittersweet seedlings per square inch. It was absolutely unbelievable how much seeding, how, how persistent or um, how prolific of a seeder they are. They are. This is one glossy buckthorn, also got this on my property, um, but is more common uh, in the Connecticut River Valley in the southern part of the state. Um, uh, I'm reviewing some forest management plans for the Wind Wyndham County Forest right now, and about all of those properties have glossy buckthorn on it. Um, when I learned it, it was in the same genus as common buckthorn. It was Ramnus frangula. It has since been split out into a different genus, frangula ulnus. It actually, except for the leaves, it doesn't really look like common buckthorn. It looks very distinctive. And the first thing I look for are those buds. So I say the buds look like Tintin's hair. So if you guys have read those Tintin books, he's got this like swoop of, of golden, reddish golden hair. And those naked buds at the end of the twigs look just like that. The leaves have that glossy, dark glossy appearance and that arcuate venation like common buckthorn leaves. What they don't have, and I, I should have mentioned this back with common buckthorn, Common buckthorn has little rounded serrations all the way around the margin of the leaf, just these teeny little rounded um, protrusions, and uh, which are not very prominent, but you can see them if you're looking close at the leaf. Uh, and glossy buckthorn does not have that. They just have a smooth margin of the leaf. The bark is purple, um, purplish, and it's speckled with these white spots. It looks like it's, it's polka dotted. Um, this is a tree that is often, it's called, also called alder buckthorn because it's often confused with, with alder. Um, so it, it grows as a small tree. I've seen them as tall as, oh, 10, 15 feet. But usually you're talking about a tree that's about an inch in diameter or less, um, you know, maybe maxing out at about 10 feet tall. Um, they also have a blackberry, as you can see on this, but they're born singly. Uh, individual berries instead of in a cluster like common buckthorn. And sometimes on my property, I also see um, them growing. It'll be a single stem and there'll be all these like whistled curvy, uh, I wish I had a picture of this to show you, but I don't. These whistled curvy sprouts kind of coming out from the bottom of the tree, making this really weird looking clump. So what is common about all these invasive exotic plants is that they are all fast spreading. And, and in almost every case, we'll compete our native species where they've been introduced. 
Um, they're almost all generalists, so they're really good at growing under all different kinds of soil conditions, site conditions, um, pretty much anywhere. Many of them are allelopathic. Um, allelopathic just means that they are introducing chemicals into the soil that are inhibiting the growth of other plants um, in one way or another. They are also all extremely resilient. Um, and so what you'll see if you ever tried to kill these and why they're such a tough nut to crack is because they're skilled at layering. So they can oftentimes sprout from just a, uh, layering is just means that it can sprout from a piece of stem you know, you don't need a whole plant to be able to sprout. Vegetative reproduction, so good at sprouting from a piece of root um, or shooting up, you know, in the case of honeysuckle, they'll run these runner roots out and then shoot up new sprouts, feed away from where the original one is. Um, and just staying alive, they are persistent and they're really good at not dying. And they also are, most of them are also prolific seeders. Um, so they uh, produce, seeds that are often spread by wildlife and they produce a lot of them and that's uh, for many of them one of the main ways that they they um, spread themselves across the landscape so why do we care about these invasives so as a forester the 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 biggest thing that i think of is what is the way that these invasives are interacting with with the way that forests grow and develop over time so one of the important things to understand is that um, is how forests work. So many of us look at a forest like this in this picture and we're like, wow, that looks really good. That's how, you know, that must be what old growth forests look like. That must be what healthy forests look like. When actually they look like this. So forests are dynamic. They're these incredibly um, dynamic changing systems that require in order to be healthy, um, constant change, disturbance, um, regeneration. So they're constantly, if you look at an old growth forest or you look at a forest which hasn't been managed in a very long period of time, what you'll see is that they are, they are stable as a system, but within that system, there's constantly death and disturbances and uh, new regeneration. And so in order for that to work, in order for that system to work, what we need is the ability of these systems to regenerate naturally. So when there's a disturbance, we need that forest to be able to respond with regeneration of a diversity of native species. And that's important uh, intrinsically, I would argue, but then also because um, these healthy forests are producing massive public benefits. So our forests, Vermont's 75% forested. Uh, those forests are cleaning our air and cleaning our water and providing habitat for wildlife and sequestering and storing carbon and providing habitat for the pollinators of agricultural crops. Um, attenuating floodwaters, protecting our infrastructure, the list goes on and on and on. And so while in Vermont's case, 80% of those forests are privately owned, uh, those uh, are producing, those privately owned forests are producing these massive public benefits that we're all enjoying. And so we all have a stake in, in the health of our forests. And also because biodiversity matters. So you can think of uh, forests, the currency of forests, and how we can determine what a healthy forest is by, uh, by its diversity. So for forests, forest diversity uh, is linked to their resilience. And this is a term that is sort of being used interchangeably with forest health now in sort of modern forestry conversations. Um, resilience is the ability of a forest to stay healthy through change and through disturbance. It is a quality that will benefit forests as our climate changes as well. Um, and so we really want to build resilience into our forests. And you can think of diversity in the, in the context of forests as sort of quantitative and qualitative. So uh, species diversity, a bunch of different species of trees is really, really important. And that's sort of the, the quantitative aspect. But then there's also this qualitative diversity. So uh, the ability of a forest to have this, you know, sort of like I was describing in the previous slide, this mosaic of different ages and sizes and um, uh, canopy heights of trees, different pockets of young forest, pockets of old forest, pockets of uh, all different sizes and ages of trees mixed together. We understand that this is how forests naturally grow by studying old growth forests in particular, that this is how forests grow and develop over time. And surprise, it's also linked to how forests are healthy, how forests are resilient. Um, it's also linked to uh, wildlife. So we want to protect diversity in our forests because we want to protect diver diversity of, of habitats and in so doing we're also going to protect, protect a diversity of native wildlife species. Um, 
wildlife are part of this amazing food web. And so what is what may seem unconnected to an individual wildlife species or a tree species that you care about can actually be, be very important. An example of this is uh, invasive plants harbor far less invertebrates than native plants, um, insects. Those form the basis of a food web which work their way on up to those, you know, those big charismatic uh, uh, animals that you really care about. They, uh, biodiversity also matters to humans. So again, healthy forests providing what are called ecosystem services, which I was mentioning before, cleaning air, cleaning water, sequestering and storing carbon, wildlife habitat, stuff like that, that we value. Um, and then also I would argue that these things have intrinsic value. So like who would say that, uh, you know, a species of wildlife uh, doesn't, doesn't deserve to exist, doesn't have the right to exist, of course they do. Um, and so protecting that biodiversity in everything we do um, is, is incredibly important. So how do we, where do we step in? How do we control these species in our environment? Um, and, I, and I use the word control intentionally because we don't talk about eradication of these invasive plants anymore. Uh, we talk about control. And what that means is lowering the population of those plants to an extent where we can pull them up by hand. We don't have to use more drastic measures to control them. So basically recognizing that they'll always be a part of our landscape. Um, and, and trying to say, so how can we get them to a level where they're not threatening our biodiversity and our ecosystems, which will not mean that they're totally gone, but will mean that we'll be still working at them all the time, um, but keeping them at a low level. Uh, to start with, if you have any invasive plants on your property, you have an invasive species problem. Um, be proactive. A small infestation of these plants will become a big infestation of these plants. They'll only get worse over time. They never get better. Um, and not doing anything about them is just going to make them get worse. And the worse they get, the less options you have for how you're going to manage them. This is a little patch of Phragmites. And so the first type of control that we talk about is mechanical control. So mechanical control just means not chemical control. Mechanical control is usually most people's first option, and it's a really good option depending on the amount of these plants that you have. Um, mechanical controls include hand pulling, so just pulling these plants up, um, girdling them, which just means you cut a little quarter inch groove all the way around the stem, you, uh, the circumference of the stem, which will kill the plant uh, in theory, uh, burning them, uh, and cutting them. Mechanical control. Uh, is you can control invasive plants for the most part using mechanical control, but most people uh, do not. And the reason for that is because uh, it requires a lot more time, a lot more energy. If you're not doing it, it yourself, it requires a lot more money um, because it will require years and years and years of repeated visits. Um, you, you will have to come back and do it again and again and again um, to have any modicum of control. That said, if you just have a couple of plants or if your plants are like right by your yard and you can just walk over there before dinner and pull them out every year or a couple times a year, great. You can totally manage that. But um, in most cases, it's not quite that simple. Uh, don't bother cutting them. It doesn't work. Like it, unless it's something where you can run your lawnmower over it uh, two or three times a year. Uh, it's probably not going to work. I've seen some creative different takes on cutting, um, cutting buckthorn, for instance, like three feet off the ground and then continually revisiting it, cutting it lower and cutting it lower and cutting it lower and draining it that way. But for the most part, if you're going to kill these things mechanically, um, you're going to want to pull them by hand. You want to pull out the whole root plant and the root system, hang it to dry somewhere so it doesn't re-sprout up in a tree. Um, for larger plants, you can get something called a weed wrench. You can actually, there are places where you can borrow these. Some public libraries are loaning them out now. Um, I know the town of Williston has one or two and in, in that um, at the, uh, my office in Essex Junction that we have some that we loan out. Um, and that can help you get out loan. That's a picture of one on the slide right there. Um, spring can be easier for pulling because the soil's wet. Mark where you've pulled because you're not gonna get, in most cases, get the whole plant out. So you'll need to return there and pull out all the new introductions that have come up from the fragments of root that you've left in the soil. And just be realistic and plan on, if you wanna do it this way, plan on multiple years of visiting the site. It's, you're not gonna get it in the first year. Um, and, and just 
again, uh, just plan your time, understand the extent of the infestation you have and figure out what you can actually manage. Because if you don't continue, if you don't go back year after year, you just won't have done anything. Um, chemical control. So in, in many cases, uh, this is what I, um, not in every case, but in many cases, this is what I and many other members of our conservation community will recommend just because um, it's way more effective and way more realistic. And this is with our eyes wide open about what herbicide is and that understanding that it's, we wish we didn't have to use these chemicals, but also understanding that there is an opportunity for these tools to be used as a, as a positive restoration tool. So we can actually use these in this really, these chemicals which may be, may be misused in other contexts um, in this really minimal targeted way, in a way that actually will support biodiversity um, and the health of our forests and the health of our other ecosystems. There's a few different ways you can apply these. Um, cut stump treatment is my favorite. That on the left is a, a tool called a buckthorn blaster, which I really love, which is a cut stump application tool. Um, you can apply a foliar spray. That's what the guy on the right is doing, um, where you're applying spray to the foliage. Um, I recommend glyphosate, which is really gonna twist your noodle because of course we all know what that chemical is because it's the most, it's the active ingredient in Roundup, which is the most widely used herbicide in the world. Um, I will, I'll be happy to talk more about glyphosate. It's by far the most benign herbicide that we have, and it's what most, uh, if not all, conservation organizations in Vermont who are doing this kind of work recommend and use. Um, in many cases, this is the only realistic way to deal with these invasive plants. So for a cut stump treatment, um, you can do it pretty much any time of the year. Again, I use that tool called a buckthorn blaster and I actually have a video on my YouTube channel. If you look up um, Chittenden County Forester YouTube channel, I, I put an instructional video about this type of treatment. I use that buckthorn blaster. Um, you cut stems, you treat the cut surface with a 20 to 40% active ingredient herbicide. Um, it's like a couple drops per plant. Um, I, in the buckthorn blaster, I use two ounces of herbicide and it's like enough for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants. Super, super targeted. Um, that said, if there's a, something like a Japanese barberry, which has very small stems, it may not be practical to go around and treat each individual stem. Um, so for that, you, you might have to use something called a foliar spray. It's not a mist blower. You're not spraying an entire forest. You're spraying from a little hand pump backpack sprayer, you're spraying individual plants with a two to 4% herbicide uh, solution, applied to leaves during the growing season, June to September. Um, again, it's appropriate for smaller plants in a dense infestation, plants with smaller stems like barberry and multiflora rose. Um, and you need to cover 75% of the target plant. And so this is actually, uh, that's a pain in the butt sometimes, but it's actually kind of an asset because if you get like a couple drops of it on a plant that you, don't want to kill by accident, um, you won't kill it. And so you can, it's amazing. You can like move a native plant out of the way with your foot and then uh, treat the plant you want to treat and that native plant will be just fine. Of course, don't, don't apply to tall plants because you don't want to spray it up in the air in case it drifts. Um, don't apply when it's windy. Don't apply when rain's forecasted. This can also be a very, very targeted uh, minimalist use of herbicide. I'm going to wrap up here so we can do some questions. So rules and regs, for herbicide application in Vermont, the, the label is the law. Um, you can apply class B herbicides on your own land. Um, on other people's land, you, you're not allowed to um, unless you're a licensed pesticide applicator. Um, I would recommend it if you're interested in it, taking the, the pesticide applicator certification course. It's a day long course that the Vermont Agency of Agriculture offers. Um, I took it and I found it to be really, really helpful. Um, and, then, and then lastly, what I'll say is that, and I want to talk more about this in these questions, but that um, what I found is that uh, the use of herbicide in many of these cases, and I know that this is what sort of like blows people's mind, um, that this is far more radical in this way than just completely saying, oh, I don't like herbicide. Herbicide has no place uh, in, you know, in the way that I'm managing the forest, no place in the world. Um, but what, you, what really needs to happen is we need to understand that this is actually a tool that we can use for good. And the good that we're using it for is so good. It's to protect our native ecosystems, to protect biodiversity, to, to protect these, these plants, which would otherwise you know, reduce the quality of habitat for our wildlife and the ability of our forests to sequester and store carbon. And this is the only realistic way to do it in a lot of cases. And herbicide will have a role in reducing uh, 
these the infestations of these plants across our landscape. And so maybe what's more radical than just rejecting them is saying, wow, I wonder if there's a way that I can use this tool, recognizing what a big deal it is and using it really carefully and minimally, but then also saying, you know, I'm gonna take this big step because I understand how important it is. Here's some resources. The only funding for invasive species control that you're gonna find is through the NRCS federal program, United States Department of Agriculture, through the EQUIP program. Um, you can visit an NRCS service center when they reopen um, to find out more about that. There is no state funding for the control of invasive plants. I wish this list were longer. Um, a good guide to check out is the, the Nature Conservancy's Vermont Landowner's Guide to Investorial Invasive Terrestrial, um, what does that say in my boxes? Blocking that. Invasive Terrestrial Plant Management. Um, and then also just, just to rep the County Forester Program, we deal with invasives a lot and we're a free resource for all landowners, um, private forest landowners in Vermont. And then vtinvasives.org uh, should be your go-to. Uh, vtinvasives.org has information on, the, on the, um, uh, the control and the identification of all these invasive plants uh, and also including other stuff like invasive pests and pathogens and stuff like that. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I would love to take your questions about this. Sorry, that went a little bit longer than I was originally planning. All right, Ethan, we have a few in the chat box and we have some very knowledgeable uh, participants that are also on there that have taken to answering some of the questions, which is awesome because that's one of the things that we really love is this peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, commenting and sharing what your experiences are. So Catherine wanted to know how you tell the difference between the native and the non-native honeysuckle. The, um, the, the trick that, that I've always heard is that the native honeysuckle um, has the, if you, if you were to break a stem, like a pencil sized stem, you would see that the native honeysuckle has a, a solid white pith and that the non-native honeysuckle has that hollow brown pith. Um, they, the, the non-native honeysuckle is much, 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 much more common. So I see the native honeysuckle somewhat rarely and I see the common honeysuckle or the invasive honeysuckle absolutely all the time. So that's, I don't think that that should be um, something that should, should give you a whole lot of pause when you're treating honeysuckle. Um, but that's, that's a trick you can use. I would also say that um, the, in general, everything about the, the invasive honeysuckle is like brittle and like straight lines. And the, the non-native honeysuckle, the, the branches and the twigs are like a little bit more pliable and sort of more of a, of a rounded appearance to the, the way that they're growing. Great. Um, question ID, Japanese barberry. Um, someone asked, is the stem bright yellow when you cut through it on Japanese barberry? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, that can be a really good way if you are hand pulling it. And if you are, best of luck to you. I tried to hand pull uh, uh, on my property, uh, Japanese barberry and it is just has an incredible root system but then if you do do that um, you can see really easily see those root fragments because they'll have that bright red bright um yellow wood okay great um Jerry wants to know given the barberry tick relationship do you know of any collaboration between the Department of Health and Forest Conservation Groups the v Vermont Department of Health is newly funded for tick-borne disease control thinking about vegetation near recreational paths in particular is what they're thinking. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, anything we can do, you know, it's just sort of this funny thing where like, of course, I just think that, you know, forests are important, forest ecology is important, and it makes it easier for us to make an argument that people will understand and value if it has some human impact. So like you can see people mobilizing to take out poison parsnip because it'll burn you. Whereas all these other plants are equally or more problematic to our forests um you know but we don't have that necessarily that direct connection but i don't i don't know of anything like that but i think that's a really good idea and i think it'd be a really um it'd be it'd be great for our forests it'd be a great way to to get some funding to do some invasive treatment work of which there is now almost none it'd be an interesting way to put out signs for education if it's along recreational paths as well yeah so, yeah um, yeah that would be interesting mm -hmm. um someone else wanted to know what is the best practice for controlling asiatic bittersweet the best practice. So, I mean, again, it depends. So like, um, I met a guy one time who uh, had a lot of time and really wanted to 
hand pull everything. And so he was digging up root systems of bittersweet. The root system of a bittersweet, he, he showed us one at a county forester retreat a few years ago that he had dug up. It was like 100 feet long, not, not an exaggeration, 100 feet long. Um, and so in that way, so your choices are essentially you can cut it. Cutting it is good because it will sever the connection between that root system and those vines. So it will theoretically kill the vines that are going in the tree, but it won't kill the plant. Um, and so you can cut it, you know, let's say it's just creeping up your house. You just cut it and cut it and cut it and cut it until it's dead. You'll probably need to cut it for years and years. Um, or you can cut it and apply a cut stump herbicide application with a buckthorn blaster and that will translocate throughout the plant and kill the plant. And that's what I would do. Um, just understanding the virulence of these plants, like in the woods, my ability to reach that plant and to cut it twice a year for the next five years to kill it is, it's just not realistic um, over my, my, you know, a larger piece of land with all these other invasive problems. Okay, great. Um, Roberta wanted to know, I think you touched on this, but I think it re bears repeating, um, is repeatedly cutting a woody invasive down at the ground level adequate to eradicate it or is digging the whole shrub up the only way? I mean, I, you know, so all of these things, all of these questions, Roberta, are, um, there, it's a capacity issue. So it is physically possible that you can cut an a buckthorn or a honeysuckle or something like that to death. Um, but I, with buckthorn, I call that just making it mad. Um, you're, you're absolutely not going to kill it that way uh, by just by cutting it once. It'll just come back and it'll come back with way more stems and way more vigorously. Um, the, the one variation on that I've seen with buckthorn that this guy, Mike Bald, who's an invasive plant contractor, I think his company's called Got Weeds, um, I've seen him do, I haven't seen it done to completion, but what he does is he'll cut the buckthorn very, like three feet off the ground, it'll sprout and he'll come back a couple times a year, cut the sprouts off and then cut it a little bit lower and just continually sort of sap its energy that way. Um, I guess Mike thinks that works. I, I haven't seen it myself. Um, but yeah, so that, that would be, I, it just, I think you either need to pull the plant up or you need to cut it and then treat the surface of the stump to get reliable results. Great, great. Um, someone asked, if, and I don't know what this is, so I haven't heard of it. Can you speak about mugwort and its effect on surrounding ticks, trees, soil, and plants? I don't know anything about mugwort. I don't either. No, oh. I would be interested awesome. to know more. I just don't know anything about it. All righty. Um, for woody herbicide treatments, what are the benefits of cut stump treatment versus basal bark treatment versus hack and squirt? I haven't used hack and squirt. So hack and squirt, for those of you who don't know, hack and squirt is you cut into the plant with a with an ax and then you basically squirt herbicide into the, um, the exposed wood or into that cut. Um, same principle essentially as a cut stump treatment in that you're just uh, applying concentrated herbicide to um, into the plant. The benefit of that would be if it was if it was you were dealing with something larger and you didn't or couldn't you know, cut them all and put them on the ground. Like if you were dealing with something like Tree of Heaven, which we don't have up here, but is, is very prominent in other parts of the, the uh, New England, um, then you wouldn't have to fell the tree. You could just hack into it and you could squirt herbicide into there. I don't see people use that that much, although I know in, in Massachusetts, they use it on witch hazel and, and they use it on some other stuff. Um, and I'm pretty, pretty sure they use it on Alanthus, which is Tree of Heaven as well. Um, the basal bark treatment, I haven't done it myself. Basal bark treatment is basically um, applying certain herbicides to, you can do it basically any season um, with a different carrying agent, like an oil um, and, and spraying that on like the 18 inches of the plant above the ground. The, what's hard about that is that you have to cover it all around every single stem of the plant, which just means I, it takes more time. I don't love working with an oil um, and spraying with an oil. Uh, but I know that some people really swear by that method, especially as far as like killing buckthorn. I just like cut stump because I think it's really clean uh, and really easy. And all you need is like a little folding handsaw and a, a buckthorn blaster you just carry in your pocket. Um, and you can just go up and take care of business. 
So there are two questions related to that. Um, one person wrote, I had understood cut stump and glyphosate application only worked August to October. Can you indeed do it in the spring or summer when the plant is not putting its energy back into the roots? Yeah, yeah. So the only, I've done research on this, especially with respect to if you can do herbicide application during the winter. And all the research that I've done has suggested that uh, it's, it's fine that you can do it, you can do it all winter long. The time when I think you really want to avoid it is like right now in the springtime when, when the plants are pushing, you know, water sap up from the root system. So they'll sort of push that herbicide off the surface of the stump. But um, I think what you're referring to August through October is the best time because that's when plants are like pulling everything down to their root system. So if you were to choose a time to do all your work, that's when you would want to do it, ideally. Um, with most landowners, it's kind of like, if you're doing it, please just do it whenever you can do it. If that means it's June, if that means it's December, if that means it's February, um, do it. But uh, yes, ideally, the best time is said to be August through like September, October. Okay, and then someone else asked about the buckthorn blaster because it says buckthorn, they were wondering, can you use it on other species? Yeah, I think <laughs> I think the buckthorn is just like, cause buckthorn blaster sounds better than honeysuckle blaster or invasive blaster. I use it on everything, on, on, right. every, on every species. And, and for the most part, glyphosate works on most stuff. There's a couple other plants that it won't work on. And some people say that there's another uh, herbicide called triclopyr, which will work better on um, multiflora rose and um, uh, buckthorn. But, but for the most part, you can use glyphosate through, with the buckthorn blaster on pretty much anything. Um, someone else noted that they eliminated a lot of buckthorn only to have garlic mustard start and they've been pulling that for years and they're wondering is there a better way and as a follow-up someone else asked what can be done to encourage native plants as the invasives are killed or removed so they kind of relate yeah and so the, the hard thing about this is it doesn't matter if you cut them or if you treat them with herbicide or whatever you do um, it you know, there is a potential that you'll get a reinvasion of something else. And, and I had that happen on my own property where I treated and I treated a bunch of barberry and then I got some garlic mustard afterwards. Um, it seems to be that these invasives, something about the way that they modify the landscape and um, they make more opportunities for other invasives to come in. Part of that is just by precluding native species and preventing forests from developing like forests normally do, are supposed to. Um, and, and in doing that, they create an opportunity for invasives to exploit that habitat. Um, so it can be really frustrating. Like for instance, if you uh, kill buckthorn, what you're gonna see is that, um, especially big tall buckthorns, which have been there a while and producing seeds, the next year you're gonna be like, well, this is great, I'm gonna get all this native stuff. And in many cases, what you're gonna get is the um, many different little buckthorn sprouts carpeting that area. And the reason for that is because Buckthorn seeds, they get eaten by birds or they just fall on the ground. They get de deposited, they're still viable, but ungerminated in the seed bank. And then when that new light is available, because you cut down all those buckthorns, they will sprout. And those seeds can remain viable for a few years. So you could potentially get more sprouts. Fortunately, in the case of buckthorn, those, those seedlings are pretty easy to kill because they're, they're not sprouts from the root system, they're new introductions. So you can just like, take a circle hoe and cultivate them or pull them up by hand or if you can use a foliar spray of, of herbicide as well if you if it's like a huge scale. Um, but yeah with all of these we have to understand invasion, invasion ecology is such that you know invaders make way for other invaders and so it's not there's not one solution that's going to like solve the problem forever. That said um, the, the amount that you need to help your ecosystems recover depends on the extent of the infestation. So uh, one of the really cool things about a buckthorn blaster or about um, you know, even doing a foliar spray is that you can actually kind of weed around your remaining native species. So at the same time that you're killing those invasives, you can be releasing small native plants and not killing them, releasing them to basically occupy that site. Um, where you really run into problems is if you have like basically pure invasives, like we see in the Champlain Valley, pure buckthorn, pure honeysuckle, stuff like that. Um, in that case, you might, it might be helpful to plant, to start something, to plant trees in that area um, in order to basically just establish some kind of a canopy, which will inhibit the continual 
regeneration of those invasive plants. And so when I see an infestation like that, that's what I recommend doing anything like white pine, even if it's, you know, in the Champlain Valley, white pine isn't a well-adapted species, but it grows quick and it can kind of grow anywhere. And all you want to do is just like establish a canopy. Um, you can also get more creative about it as well. Um, but that's, that's what I would say. I would say ideally, you know, ideally you don't have to do that because you're recruiting and weeding around all these native species that you want to grow. But sometimes if it's like this complete infestation, that's what, you, that's what would make sense to do. Great. Um, someone asked, uh, if you have buckthorn stumps that have been cut previously, can you use the buckthorn blaster on any new shoots the following year? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can. The one thing I thought you were going to say, um, if you, the one thing about cut stump is that you need to, once you cut that plant, you need to treat it like within 20 minutes or it's not, or it's not going to be nearly as effective. So you need to treat it right away. But yeah, sometimes you'll get some sprouts and then I would just cut them again, treat them again. And with that cut stump um, option, someone wants to do, what do you do with the tops? Do you burn them? Do you just leave them there? What, what should you do with what you've um, If it's, so if you're, if, um, you know, if it's a plant or two, ideally you want to get them off the ground. Um, again, because they are so good at layering. Uh, less buckthorn than honeysuckle and multiflora rose and some of these other ones. Um, so you want to ideally get them off the ground. I found that with, with like honeysuckle, um, if you make kind of a pile, they don't really tend to, to layer like that. I also, in general, um, if I'm doing like treatment on my land, whereas, you know, acres and acres and acres are pure invasives, I really want to prioritize my time on killing invasives. And I understand that some layering will happen when those things lay on the ground, um, but it doesn't happen a ton. And so I wouldn't worry about it too much. But if you can, ideally piling them, for, you know, first choice would be get them off the ground hang them on a tree, um, get them lifted off the ground in some other way. Second choice would be piling them. And then third choice would be just putting them on the ground and hoping, you know, and, and assuming that some layering might happen, but then just recognizing that you're taking the time to really, you know, move through and keep on treating and cutting plants and not taking the time to, to neatly stack everything. That said, there are a couple of plants like garlic mustard, do not leave it on the ground because garlic mustard will produce seeds even after you've cut it. Even if you cut it, you know, and it's just laying on the ground, it still will produce seeds. So you want to cut and bag those. Um, so yeah, so I think there are different options. Ideally though, off the ground would be the best choice. Excellent. Um, we had a few questions about things you didn't talk about. So some yeah. people want to know, although it's native, what about grapevines that kind of take over? Can we think about the grapevines? What do we do there? Yeah, grapes are a tough one. Um, I've seen, so there's this whole like other uh, kind of like subset of invasive species, which are uh, native species, which have become invasive in response to human created conditions. So like a really good example of this is staghorn sumac. Everybody hates staghorn sumac, right? Cause it like takes over your yard. It's impossible to kill. Um, it's a native plant. But um, in response to yards and edges, which are sort of an unnatural uh, and, you know, little micro environment, uh, it has become very invasive in some cases. And so, uh, you know, how to deal with those is, and, and grape is, is in the same vein. So grape, like, I see grape behaving very invasively, preventing forest succession from occurring, and almost sometimes acting a little bit like uh, bittersweet, you know, just sort of like, bringing every crashing everything down on a proportion that I think is not in proportion with what it would be doing naturally on edges. So on my land, it's on the edge of the highway and on the edge of the power line corridor, grape is just going crazy and it's basically preventing my forest from, from regenerating. So in that context, I'll treat grape just like an invasive species, but I also recognize that it's an important soft mass species for wildlife in the woods. Uh, some amount of that grape pulling trees down, grape, you know, causing little openings is actually natural. And, and I think we can totally support it. It's just in response to these edges, sometimes it goes a little crazy, you know? And so I would, again, like staghorn sumac, like I would argue like white-tailed deer on our landscape right now, a native species uh, in response to human created conditions behaving invasively. And so you sort of have to, you know, create a nuanced way of dealing with it or thinking about it. 
Okay. Um, someone asked also, is the wild cucumber considered an invasive species? They recently purchased a house and the plants everywhere and up in their trees and choking out vegetation. They want to know if that was invasive and what they might be able to do. I, so I think your, your wild cucumber is a, is a native plant. I think you're thinking of what I used to call no, maybe wild cucumber. It's a it's a vine. It's like a vine with like a prickly seed pod. Yeah, they called it muscadine. I hadn't heard of that. Mm. Yeah, I don't know that much about it. I feel like I've heard that it is invasive, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Um, let's see. What else do I have over here that I might have missed as I tried to get things? Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, and Sabina was just pointing out, so there's there's also what, what I would call Indian cucumber, which is like an invasive plant. What you're talking about is a vine, which is a different cucumber. Jeff was wondering with buckthorn, we're back to buckthorn, um, is it um, better to treat before the berries have been set? You know, and they could talk about treating it in the fall. Is it better to treat before the berries are set? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like one way to approach any invasive plant infestation, like, is to take out the you know take out the ones that are making the berries first. Um, you know if the berries have been set, they've already been producing berries for a very long time. The advantage of doing it before they're set is that you know then th that generation of berries isn't viable theoretically, and then you you know you don't have to worry as much about those berries falling on the ground when you cut the plant. Um, but that just reminds me that one way to approach if you have a lot of different plants, one you know one way to sort of approach your uh, treatment of those plants is start with the ones that are producing the berries. So the ones that are, you know, continually reintroducing more invasives and, you know, I would uh, in also producing seeds which are infecting uh, the properties of your neighbors and like across our landscape. So prevent that from happening um, by killing those large seed bearing individuals and then sort of work your way uh, into the forest uh, and, and so then you're like, you know that it's not just that you're cutting plants just for those plants to, for seeds to continue to rain down in that area. Um, that's, that's where I would start um, with, the big, with the big seed bearing plants. Um, right. and I, would, I would also argue that the nature of these as seed, seed sources, like I think that uh, inaction, so not doing anything about, uh, about these invasive plants is kind of like pollution because it's not, it's not limited to your property, right? Like these buckthorn seeds are getting eaten by cedar waxwings, which are flying over to your neighbors and flying all across our landscape uh, and contributing to ecosystem health problems everywhere. Um, and so I think that, that that needs to be acknowledged as well, that uh, not doing anything is also a choice, uh, but it's one that really, really uh, affects us all negatively. It's not limited to just you and your forest. Great. Um, there's a few other questions. Uh, the last one I'm going to go with so we can end on time was a recommendation about using glyphosate near wetlands. Is there a concentration that you should be considering using or how does that regard? Yeah, so, so um, in, a, in, a wetland, in a mapped wetland area, you need a permit. So you need to contact a state wetland ecologist. Um, there are formulations of, of herbicide that are considered to be wetland safe. So I think that the chemical glyphosate itself is considered to be uh, wetland safe, but that there are additives and surfactants like in Roundup, uh, which are not necessarily considered to be that way. And so there's different formulations that are considered either wetland safe or, or not wetland safe. And I would just, I would just defer to the label um, on that. You know, and I think that in general, if you're going to use an herbicide, um, that I would use one that's wetland safe anyway, because you know, you just don't want to, in case like it would, it were to come into contact with groundwater, groundwater or surface water or something like that, you just wouldn't want anything that would harm, you know, some of our, our wetland ecology anyway. And I would say that one of the, the benefits of glyphosate specifically, and this is why uh, everybody uses it, um, not in an agricultural sense, but in a, in a landscape restoration sense, everybody uses it because it is, um, it breaks down really quickly in the soil. It bonds strongly to soil particles, so it's not leaching into groundwater. It doesn't have any soil activity, uh, so it's not going to kill. If it gets onto the soil, into the soil, it's not going to kill any plants through the soil, um, and it doesn't bioaccumulate. So uh, that, as far as herbicides go, it's by far uh, the one that I would choose above all others. And it's, it's very interesting because people will, because, just because it's the most widely used herbicide in the world, uh, 
there's everybody knows what it is. So, so people are scared of it for good reason. The way it's used in agriculture is not necessarily appropriate. And, um, in my view, uh, but, uh, it is, you know, despite all that, it is like actually a pretty incredible tool for habitat restoration. And one that again, um, it's uncomfortable, uh, but it is, I think necessary. And it's something that we can do to make that hard decision to protect our ecosystems and, and our native biodiversity. Um, I think it's worth it. I really, really do. Um, and I think that the, the, you know, anything that could, anything negative that would, could come from, from herbicides is far exceeded by the negative impacts of these invasive plants on, on literally every aspect of our forests. Um, and so I really think it's worth it. That's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Ethan. I've added to the chat box all of our contact information, Ethan's, uh, myself, and Kathleen's. Um, we will be posting this. Ethan will post it on his YouTube channel, which we have, um, I also put in the chat box, along with um, uh, on VWAs and covered. So you'll have access to this uh, in a number of different places if you want to re-see it. If you have some questions that weren't answered, again, those emails were in the chat box and you're welcome to email any one of us. Uh, join our e-news uh, to see what's coming up. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you're able to take something away that you can put into action in your own uh, woodlands. Yep, and, and I would just say again, um, if you wanna be kept apprised of these events, um, email me if you wanna get on my email list, sign up for Vermont Woodlands Association and for Vermont Coverage e-news, follow them on social media. Um, you can check out some of the, the videos on my YouTube channel and um and also consider uh contributing to the, the amazing work that covers and that vwa are are both doing it's really really important thanks all bye